basically wanted to do a really campy movie in mind and our, my friend at the time his name is Benjamin Dover Ben Dover which is ironic name um, <laughs> but uh, he basically came up with the idea that we needed to do some kind of massacre movie to kind of do some, one of those some of the, like like some kind of throwback so one movie that came to mind was the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and he was like I like the idea of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre but let's Let's make it even more ridiculous. Like, we need to have the weapon be really over the top. So the idea he came up with was a weed whacker because, you know, a weed whacker hurts when it hits you, but it, you know, I don't, it can't kill you. But he wanted to make it look like it can kill you in this movie. And so that's kind of what we rolled with. And other influences would probably be Maximum Overdrive, how, like, the, the trucks and cars came to life and was mowing people down. So it's kind of a similar situation in that movie, you know. But the movie, in our movie, basically how the Weed Whacker comes to life is there's this really, really grouchy ma old man, and he basically is really pissed off because the the neighborhood he, he lives in is called it's 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 the, well the name of the town is Dogwood, but the place that he lives in is Dogwood Heights, and it's this like really old school neighborhood. So he's kind of old school, and there's a bunch of new people living there, and he's getting very angry because they keep asking him to cut his grass, even though his grass is cut. And really what they're implying is they want him to leave. So he gets really mad and he goes outside and he cuts his grass again. And what happens is, is he, um, he doesn't realize it, but like he's standing in a puddle of water and he plugs in the weed whacker and it shocks him to death and his, his soul gets transferred into the weed whacker. So when, he, when his soul gets transferred to the weed whacker, the weed whacker comes alive and goes on a killing spree basically. And one thing that really stands out for this film uh, that like that my friend Ryan really wanted to put out there is that the, the, the lead role is an African American male. It's our friend Nate, and we wanted to, we wanted to we wanted to kind of break the stereotype of you know African American males always being the, the first one to die in a movie because it's always it's always been such a such a bad stereotype. And what's funny is in this movie he's the guy that saves the day and ends up beating the weed whacker, which is pretty 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 funny. So that's basically the movie. It's just. Just a throwback, campy, like 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 early '80s, you know, exploitation type horror movie. I'm a really huge fan of '80s movies, and I'm a really huge fan of '90s movies. Um, but specifically, I went back and started watching some '70s films uh, about a year or two ago. And what's really interesting about that is, is I, there's a lot. It was like the exploitation like time period like there was a lot of exploitation films around that time period when it came to horror came to like crime movies just various types of movies especially sex exploitation was like really big in the 70s so i like that genre um i mean it was really it was really discriminatory against different races and sex um around that time period but i think those movies are really important because it really showed how filmmaking was changing over time you know because you, you came from an era in the 1950s where everything was really repressed. And I almost feel like the exploitation genres that came out of the 60s and 70s was kind of a backlash against that. So basically what I was trying to do is, is I was trying to think, hey, I can make a movie that is set in modern times, but I can make it seem like an exploitation film, make it seem like an 80, have that 80s feel. Because that's, 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 that's the kind of the soundtrack we went with is more 80s, not really 70s. And I studied the color, like, to the T. I went and found te a Technicolor LUT lookup table, and I applied it to my footage. And I went in and I added, like, film grain, particle effects, you know, like, dust and stuff like that. And basically, it look, looked like it was wear and tear on the film. And, you know, obviously, I didn't shoot on film. I shot on digital. But it, I made it look like it was an old film that you would, like, you know, you'd be going through your garage and you dust something off and you're like, oh, what the hell is this, you know? That's kind of kind of what we were going for with that. So you got to add artifacts, you know? Um, especially film grain. 
Like, that, there's something that digital just doesn't do anymore and that there's no film grain. And film grain is what gives a lot of movies this very appealing look, you know? Like, one movie in particular that I love that really has a really great film grain is probably The Graduate. I don't know if you've ever seen The Graduate. Yeah, I love the film grain in that movie. It looks really good. You know, it's 1967, 68. And that's when, that's the first time they used, that was, that was, that was around the first time when, when color was, like, becoming really popular. Like, color, color had been a thing since the 30s, you know, with, with, with The Wizard of Oz. But that's when color really started exploding like crazy was, the, was like, the, like the late 50s going on into the 60s. So then, you know, it had all those really, really bright, vibrant colors. But even the dynamic range of those cameras changed drastically in the 60s, you know. It's kind of where it started getting its really, really nice look. Um, like the, 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 the big, I guess, I guess the overall big appeal is like this grandioso blockbuster type of thing going on in the 60s. Because the blockbusters weren't, the, like, weren't the same in the 50s as they were in the 60s. It seems like the 60s is when blockbusters started coming out. Like, you know, like Bonnie and Clyde and stuff like that. So we started with the old man. You know, my friend Ryan was like, hey, we need to get an old man. And I was like, okay, I know the perfect guy. There's a local guy named William Tokarski here in Atlanta. And that's who we were going to get first. But then William told me that he was going to pass on it because he's trying to get away from the whole grumpy old man kind of thing that he's doing. And he's trying to move into more serious stuff. At least that's what he told me. And I, th and I think he's been somewhat successful with it over the past year. But I know when we were looking for the old man, I originally had other people in mind, but my friend Ryan was like, I know this guy. And I go, who is he? And he goes, he goes just, just meet him. And he introduced me to him and I was like, oh my God, this guy's perfect. Cause he had some of his teeth missing. He had like a crazy beard with crazy old man, you know, like hair that was all slicked back. And he was wearing that sh old man shirt with the, with the, sh with the shirt and button. And I was just like, this is Mr. Thurman. This is our Mr. Thurman. So that was easy. That was an easy choice. Mr. Thurman was just finding that guy. It was perfect. And he was, he's a very talented actor. He's a theater actor. So it made it even easier, you know, to cast that guy. And the rest of them were just friends of mine that are all actors. Cause you know, when you, when you work in the film industry, you meet so many different types of people and you know what their range is and what they can do. And all the people that I picked are actors that can turn on that over the top you know, acting when I want them to. And that's, that's, that's what they, and that's, that's, I feel like that's what they did in this movie. Like, they, they basically gave us exactly what we wanted. And that's, that's all I can ask out of people, you know, that I work with is that they can give me the best they can. And I feel like they knew exactly the direction we were going with, with this. And that, that's, that's really hard to do sometimes because sometimes you'll get actors and they, they have no idea, like, how to, go with the movie and it could either be weak directing or just them misinterpreting the story you know but I feel like one good thing about all the actors we brought on they they knew exactly what they were getting into if you, if you catch my grip catch my grip you know <laughs> so it was a combination of both practical and visual effects uh, heavy heavy practical with very subtle uh, visual effects just because we didn't want it to look too cheesy but we wanted it to look good enough where it was very subtle, um, a lot of the a lot of the, the like the scrapes and all that that was all prosthetics, and we had uh, the weed whacker actually had a hose ran up inside of it, so when it would when it would be attacking somebody, somebody would be pumping it up, and it would actually squirt blood out as it was attacking people, so it looked like the blood was like coming out of their arm. So that was kind of a way we had to be really creative with that. And one thing I can say is is that a combination with because my friend did the, the visual effects, and at first he was like, hey, maybe we should do, um, make it really bloody and gory, and I was like, how about we just take the bloody and goriness that's already been applied with the practical and just add very subtle, you know, CGI. Kind of like what they did with the new Star Wars movie, you know? You know, the new Star Wars movie, it was all, they did, they went back to the puppetry, but they also did, mo uh, you know, cap motion capture as well, and it kind of made for a really, really fluid, look you know so the artist's name is two strip technicolor and he specifically um does stylistic reminiscent uh drew streisand type posters and everything he does is all digital digitally painted he has like a from what i understand he has like one of those um he has, i think he has an imac that has like a big 
touch board on it, and he's able to go in and draw. And basically what we did is we just sent him pictures, stills from the movies, and he took all those stills, and he just, like, like got it to memory, and he just drew it, basically. So he, he kind of... He, the way he does it, he said he does it like a pencil, like like pencil drawing. He, he basically sketches everything out, you know, like a pencil, and then he goes in and he fills out, he fills in the color. It's kind of like when you, you're you doing like a sketch on a pad, and that's the way he described it to us. So that's basically how he did it. He did a, he did a digital drawing of, of the f- pictures I sent him, and I wanted him to tell a story in the poster just with the, just with the, the pictures we sent him. You know, the, you know, the reason why Nate... Um, the mailman is looking at Mr. Thurman is because they're going to have the conflict and the other characters on the bottom are all mainly just lambs to the slaughter, you know? Let's, uh, I feel like, I feel like, see, like, this one thing I learned about marketing, you know, when you market a film, like, when people look at your film, they're going to look at your trailer, but really what they're going to look at is your poster, and if your poster doesn't look very good, they're probably not going to watch it, and that's unfortunate, but it's just a fact of life, you know, because... Most of the time, people don't even want to watch your trailer because you know how people are these days. They have such a short attention span, and it's easier just to look at a poster because you know you, you have to spend you only spend like a couple seconds looking at it, you know. And we just wanted to make something that's throwback to like an '80s style poster, but also catch people's eye, you know. So that's kind of what we were going for. The puppet, the puppet we did for the for the weed whacker, it broke hundreds of times, and I got really frustrated every time. Because I was like, man, I hate this puppet. I hate this freaking puppet. I hate it. And he was just like, dude, it's going to be worth it. I'm like, I hate it. Because it, I, I was a DP, so I was like behind the camera, and we would get a perfect shot, but then the puppet would break. And I'm like, man, come on, man. Like, that was such a good shot. And he was just like, I, that, that was one thing that got really, that really frustrated me. But moments that really made me laugh was when we were getting the, sh- the shots of the weed whacker traveling down the street because it was literally me on the back of a truck with a, with, a, with a camera mounted with a tripod with a sandbag so it's weighed down and one of the actors had the, had the weed whacker and he was just doing this as we were driving and it was really funny because I'll never forget it we were, we were driving and we came to a stop sign and my friend my, my actor friend was still doing that and this lady pulls up behind me and she goes and then she looks at her husband, and her husband, like, is looking out the window, and looks over and he goes, like, he just got shocked, because he, he didn't expect to see something like that. Because, you know, you, you, from their perspective, it's just someone with a camera and someone with a weed whacker just doing this. It's, like, it's ridiculous, you know, from an outside perspective, you know? So, yeah. I honestly say, out of all the movies I've ever made, this is probably the most fun I've ever had making a movie, because we kind of just rolled with it and kind of just... We really didn't have a storyboard, you know? We didn't really have much of a shot list. We just kind of, we kind of wanted to make it look gorilla as much as we could, you know? Like, kind of like that raunchy gorilla, you know, early, like early 80s, you know, grindhouse style filmmaking where you just, you just get a bunch of equipment and you go make a movie. But we obviously knew the locations. We did a lot of location scouting and I already knew what shots I wanted to get before we even did the film, so... You know, we did some preparation, but for the most part, we just kind of let the creativity flow.